This is the video for Chapter 2 about summarizing and graphing data. And here are the sections that we'll be looking at in this chapter. The first one is the review and preview. We won't actually go over any of that in this video. Section 2 is about frequency distributions. Section 3 is about histograms. Section 4 is about statistical graphics. And Section 5 is about critical thinking, specifically about bad graphs. So first, let's talk about Section 2.2, about frequency distributions. A key concept in this section is that when we're working with large data sets, it often helps if we can organize and summarize the data by constructing a table. This is called a frequency distribution, and we'll look more at these later. Now, because computer software and calculators can generate the frequency distributions for us, the details of constructing them are not as important as what they tell us about data sets. However, we will look at how to construct a frequency distribution. Because if you know how frequency distributions are constructed, that will help you in being able to interpret frequency distributions. So first of all, a frequency distribution, this can also be called a frequency table, just lists data values, either individually or by groups of intervals, along with their corresponding frequencies. And a frequency is just the same as a count. Here's an example of a frequency distribution. So notice how we have different intervals for the values. So we have ages of drivers from 10 to 19, 20 to 29, and so on. On this side, we have the frequencies. In other words, the number of drivers that were between 10 and 19 that were killed in motorcycle accidents was 7. The number that were between 20 and 29 was 11. So the frequencies here are just the counts of how many are in each particular category. Now we'll look at constructing a frequency distribution. First of all, if we have a set of data, we want to divide the range of data values into equal groups, which we call classes. These are also in some places called bins. Once we have divided the range into equal classes, then we're going to just count how many data values are in each class. This gives us the frequencies. So here's an example. We have a list of ages of actors that won the Best Actor Award in the Academy Awards. Step one is going to be to find the class width, or in other words, the distance between the classes. This is part of dividing our data values into equal groups. There are a couple of different ways we can do this. First of all, we can start by deciding on how many classes we want, and the number of classes in order to make a good frequency distribution should be somewhere between 5 and 20. If it's less than 5 or more than 20, it doesn't work as well. So we can start by deciding on the number of classes, or we can start by deciding on the class width, if that makes more sense in the situation. If you decide on the number of classes first, then you find the class width by using this formula. The class width is going to be the range divided by the number of classes. You find that value, and then you're going to round up to the next whole number. And remember, when you're doing this, the range is going to be the maximum data value minus the minimum data value. Let's look at how we would do this for our data from the best actors. If we find the maximum age, it would be 76. The minimum age in this whole list would be 29. So our range would be 76 minus 29, which is 47. And for instance, if we decided to use 9 classes, the class width would be 47 divided by 9, which is 5.2. And then we would round that up to the next whole number, which would be 6. That would give us a class width of 6. Now, whether you use this method or if you decide on the class width, again, depends on the situation. In a situation like this where we're talking about ages, it might actually make more sense to decide on the class width first because we're used to thinking about ages in terms of decades. So 10 years would be a convenient class width to use, and it would be easier to understand than using 6 years. Step 2 of constructing a frequency distribution is to find the starting point, which is the lower class limit for the first class, and then to find the rest of the lower class limit. 
So the starting point can either be the minimum data value or it can be a number less than that if it makes more sense. What we do once we find that starting point is we add that number to the class width to get the starting point for the next lower class limit. We continue this process to get the rest of the lower class limits and we list all of these in a vertical column. Going back to our example with the best actors ages, our minimum value was 29. Since in this case we decided to use 10 years for our class width, it would actually make more sense to start at either 20 or 25 instead of 29. So for this example, we'll start with 20. That means 20 would be our first lower class limit. To get the next one, we'd add 10 because 10 was our class width. So our next lower class limit is going to be 30. And then we would just keep going up by 10 from there to get the rest of our lower class limits. Here's what this would look like. So now, with the beginnings of our frequency table, we have all of our lower class limits listed. And notice that the last one we use is 70 because the maximum data value was 76. So the last class we need to have is starting at 70. The next step is to find the upper class limit. And for this, each upper class limit must be less than the lower class limit of the next class. Because the way we want this to work, for any data value, we only want it to fit into one class. It won't work if we have a data value that could fit possibly into two different classes. So the easiest way to find the upper class limits is to look at each lower class limit and just subtract one unit. And by one unit, we mean Say, if the data values are measured in tenths, we'd subtract one-tenth, one-tenth. If they're measured in hundreds, then we'd subtract one-hundredth, and so on. And then we put the upper class limits in the table. So for our example, the upper class limit of the first class, to find out, we would look at the lower class limit of the second class, which was 30. We'd subtract one unit, and in this case, we're using actually units for our values. So subtracting one unit would give us 29. That would be the upper class limit for our first class. The upper class limit for our next class would be 40 minus 1, which is 39, and so on. So now here's what our frequency table would look like. So for each class, we have our lower class limit and our upper class limit. And notice how we go from an upper class limit of 29, we go up one unit, to the lower class limit for the next class. And we do that every time. So that there's no value in here that ends up being in two different classes. That's one of the common mistakes when you're constructing a frequency table is to think that since the class width is 10 in this case, that, for example, your first class would go to, from 20 to 30. However, if we did that, then 30 would show up in two different places. And then if we had a data value that was 30, we wouldn't know which class to put it into. So it is very important that your upper class limits and your lower class limits are not the same values. So now we have a complete picture of all the classes and each data value, again, is going to fit into one and only one class. So our final step is to find the frequency for each class. And to do this, all we have to do is go through the list of data values and mark which class each data value fits into. You can even go down your frequency table and just, just use tick marks to count how many values are in each class. So our completed frequency distribution would look like this. What this tells us is that for the ages, for the age class of 20 to 29, there was only one actor in that age class. From 30 to 39, we found 24, 
from 40 to 49 there were 33 and so on. Notice that there was only one in the 70 to 79 age category. Now just to make it clear about the lower class limits and the upper class limits, so if we're looking at this table, the lower class limits are the values on the left here, so 21, 31, and so on. And notice that if we look at these as they go down, each one goes up by 10. The upper class limits are the values on the right side. So this would be the 30, the 40, the 50, the 60, and so on. Now some other values that you might need to find when you're dealing with frequency tables are the class boundaries, and these are the numbers halfway between the upper class limits and the lower class limits for the next class. So a class boundary is actually between class limits. Class boundaries also have to include a value below the starting point and a value above the highest upper class limit. So back to our table with the ages of best actresses. If we're looking for class boundaries for these, first we need to start with a value below our starting point. So we'll need to come up with a value below this one. Before we actually calculate that value, let's look at what our next class boundary would be. It would need to be something halfway between this value and this value. So it needs to be halfway between 30 and 31. Now to find that, actually we can just find the average of 30 and 31. So to do that, we would take 30 plus 31 and divide by 2. Now that's going to give us the value that's halfway between these two, which would be 30.5. Now the reason for doing that one first is it gives us an idea of what our class boundaries are going to look like. Basically, they're going to be 0.5 above or below an upper class limit or a lower class limit. And that tells us that the first class boundary is going to need to be below 21, so we're going to go 0.5 below 21, which would give us 20.5. So here would be our class boundaries. And notice that they also follow a pattern. If we found our first two, as we have here, the 20.5 and the 30.5, notice that the distance between these is 10. And notice that for each of the other class boundaries, we're just going up by another 10 units. So that would be an easy way to find the rest of our class boundaries, is just by using the class width. Now, there are also sometimes when we'll need to find the class midpoint. And to find the class midpoint, find the average of the lower class limit and the upper class limit for one specific class. To do that, you can just add the lower class limit and the upper class limit and then divide that by two. So again, with our best actresses table, if we wanted to find the class midpoint for this class, here we would take 21 plus 30 and divide by two. Notice that this is all within the same class. And really what we're doing by doing this is just going halfway between 21 and 30. And if we calculate that, we're going to end up with 25.5. So we could do the same thing for the rest of our classes. For this one, we would take 31 plus 40 and divide by 2 and so on. So these would be the class midpoints for each class. And notice again that all of these differ by 10 units. So once we find the first one, actually all we have to do to get the rest of them is add our class width, which is 10 in this case. Now I keep talking about class width, and this is something, again, it's very easy to get mixed up about because it's not the distance between a lower class limit and an upper class limit. Rather, it's the distance between two consecutive lower class limits so between 21 and 31 would be 10, or between two consecutive upper class limits. And you can pick any two as long as they're consecutive. So if you look at these two upper class limits, the distance between those is 10. And that means that our class width for this table is 10.
why do we spend so much time on frequency distribution? These are very useful when we're, especially when we're looking at large data sets. They allow us to summarize the data set. They allow us to gain some insight into the nature of the data. They also give us a basis for constructing important graphs like histograms, which we'll talk about later. There's also something called a relative frequency distribution. A relative frequency distribution uses the same class limits as a regular frequency distribution. The only difference is that we use what we call relative frequencies instead of the actual frequencies or counts. And by a relative frequency, we mean a percentage. So a relative frequency is going to be the frequency for a specific class divided by the sum of all the frequencies, or in other words, the total number of data values. The nice thing about relative frequency distributions are that if we're trying to compare two sets of data, especially when the number of data values in the two data sets are different, they give us a better way to compare the frequencies in those two sets of data. Let's do an example of how to create a relative frequency distribution from a regular frequency distribution. Here is a frequency table that gives the ages of actresses that won the Best Actress Award. And we have our classes with a, with a class width of 10. And here are our frequencies over here. So in order to get a relative frequency distribution from this, the first thing we need is to total our frequencies. In other words, to find out how many total data values we had in this data set. So we're going to add these frequencies. And that will give us the total number of data values in the set, which turns out to be 76. The reason we need that is in order to get the relative frequencies, we're going to take each of our frequencies for each class and divide it by that total. To get the relative frequency for this class, we're going to take 28 and divide it by our total of 76. Now that's going to give us a relative frequency in decimal form. And in order to convert it to percent, if we want it in percentage form, we would multiply it by 100, which is the same as moving the decimal point two places to the right. If we do that with each one of these classes, then here is the relative frequency distribution that we get. And notice here that all of our relative frequencies are represented as percentages. Again, you could represent them as decimal if you wanted to. So instead of having 37% here, you could represent this as 0.37. That would be the decimal form. So this could be 0.39 and so on. And again, to get those values, we took the actual frequency from each class and divided it by 76. So here would be how we got the first two. And to get to the percentage, 28 by 76, 28 divided by 76 would be approximately 0.37. And then we would take the decimal point and move it over two places to the right to get our 37%. Now, as I said before, relative frequency distributions can be very useful if you're comparing two data sets that have different total frequencies. If we're comparing these two frequency tables, since there are so many more car accidents included in this data than there are motorcycle accidents included in this data, it's a little bit hard to tell the differences between the two data sets by looking at the regular frequencies. So if we took each of these frequency tables and created a relative frequency table, that would give us a better way to compare these two sets of data. So again, to create a relative frequency table from this, we would take our frequencies here and add up that whole list. And then whatever number that turned out to be, we would take the frequency from each class and divide it by that number. That would give us a decimal form of our relative frequency. To convert it to a percentage, we would move the decimal place over two places. We would move the decimal point over two places. So here would be our relative frequency table. And then we could do the same thing for the motorcycle accident. We would add up this column of numbers and get a total. And then we would divide each one of these frequencies by that total and then move our decimal point over to get percentages. So there would be our relative frequency table for the motorcycle accident. Now looking at these two relative frequency tables, 
you can immediately see that the number of motorcycle drivers between 20 and 29 that were killed in motorcycle accidents has the biggest share of any of these percentage-wise. So this gives you a much better idea of how these two data sets compare. For the motorcycle drivers data set, the 20 to 29 age group, group has the largest frequency by far. For the car driver data set, this class doesn't even have the largest percentage of car drivers. Now when we're interpreting frequency distributions, one of the things that we'll be looking at a lot in later chapters is a normal distribution. And one of the key things about a normal distribution is that it has a bell shape. And when we talk about a bell shape, it's basically something like this. It has a hump in the middle. It starts out low on one end, goes up to a high point in approximately the middle, and then goes back down on the right end also. So the frequencies start low and then increase to a high point around the middle and then decrease back to a low point. And for us to have a normal distribution, this picture should be somewhat symmetric, which means that we should have a mirror image on either side of this middle point. One more type of frequency distribution is a cumulative frequency distribution. To get cumulative, that just means that we accumulate the frequencies as we go down through the classes. So instead of listing the frequencies just for each class, for example, for the second class, we would actually add the frequencies from the first two classes. So the frequency, the cumulative frequency for the second class would be 58. To get the one for the third one, we'd add 58 to 12, which would be 70, and so on. So we're just adding as we go along. So here's what our cumulative frequency distribution would look like for this set of data. And notice also that this changes the way our classes look. Because this is no longer, for example, right here, the 70 doesn't represent just the drivers that were between 41 and 50. It represents all of them that were 50 or younger. So anyone who was less than 51 years of age. So to review a little bit, we've talked about three different types of frequency distributions or frequency tables. A regular frequency distribution, which just has counts for each class. A relative frequency distribution, which has relative frequencies either in percentage form or in decimal form. And a cumulative frequency distribution, where the frequencies accumulate as we go down through the classes. And again, this changes the way our classes actually are described. Section 2.3 is about histograms. And a histogram is an important type of graph that portrays the nature of the distribution. And actually, a histogram is a specific type of bar graph. And in this course, we use histograms to represent only quantitative data. The definition of a histogram is that it's a bar graph where the horizontal scale represents the classes of data values and the vertical scale represents the frequencies. Now, if we already have a frequency distribution, it's easy to create a histogram for this. All we have to do is list the classes along the horizontal axis and the frequencies along the vertical axis. So here's what a histogram of this frequency distribution would look like. And notice that for this graph, the way the classes were represented at the bottom was by using class boundaries. But that does give you an idea of where the classes are split up. And the height of each bar gives us the frequency for that particular class. Here are some more examples of histograms. This one is from our frequency table for the ages of best actors. And notice how our classes are represented on this horizontal axis. It actually lists the upper and lower class limits for each class. And again, our bar heights represent our frequencies. So for example, if you looked at the 30 to 39 age class, you could guess that the frequency for this class would be 24. 
from looking at how high the bar is compared to our vertical scale over here. So this is one way to represent the classes on the horizontal axis. Here's some other ways that they are sometimes represented. And this all depends on what software you're using or what the person who's creating the graph chooses to do for representation. In this graph, approximately the midpoint of each class was used. So if we were looking at this histogram and trying to interpret it, we'd have to do a little bit of guessing as to what the actual class limits were. But we could guess that this would be either 40 to 49 or 41 to 50, for example. And in this one, we've got our horizontal axis values occurring right at the class boundary. So again, it would be a little bit hard to tell in this case whether our classes went from, say, 40 to 49 or from 41 to 50. We can get a general idea of what the data looks like and what the shape of our distribution is. A relative frequency histogram has the same shape and horizontal scale as a regular histogram, but the vertical scale has relative frequencies instead of the actual frequencies. Again, if we have a relative frequency distribution already created, it's easy to create a relative frequency histogram from this. So for this one, again, our classes are going to be represented on the horizontal axis. And for this, our vertical axis will have the relative frequencies represented as percentages. Here's what our relative frequency histogram would look like. And notice that this has the same shape as the histogram that we already looked at for this data set. The difference is that over here on the vertical axis, we have the percentages instead of having actual counts. And just like with frequency distributions, we can use relative frequency histograms to compare two data sets more easily. If we look at our two data sets about drivers killed in crashes, if we're using a frequency histogram, then it's a little bit hard to tell what the differences between the two data sets are. But if we use relative frequency histograms, then we can compare right across the board what our percentages are. Notice that these two relative frequency histograms use the same scale on the vertical axis. That makes it much easier to compare side by side. Now, when we're interpreting histograms, we'll be thinking a lot about normal distributions. When we look at a histogram like this, if we're thinking about whether this has an approximately normal distribution or not, then we're looking for this kind of bell shape. Notice that this one starts with low frequencies, goes up to a high point in the middle, and then comes back down to low frequencies. And it's not exactly symmetric, but it's approximately symmetric. So this would have an approximately normal distribution. We can identify other characteristics about the data also from the frequency distribution. Things like the class width, the minimum and maximum possible values for the data, and the class with the highest and lowest frequencies. For example, with this histogram, it's not immediately obvious what the class width is. We would have to do a little bit of investigation. Notice that we do have one class starting here at 60 and this class ending at 70 and there are five bars in between there. So this is a difference of 10 from 60 to 70. If we divide 10 by five bars, that means that our class width would have to be two. And that tells us something about the minimum and maximum possible data values. If our class width is two, then if this is 60 and we're going to have 58 here and 56 here, and that tells us that the smallest possible data value in this data set would be 56. And if we go over to the other end here, we go from 70 up to 72, that tells us that the largest possible data value in this set would be 72. And another thing we could look at would be the classes with the highest and lowest frequencies. The highest bar would be the class with the highest frequency. So that would be this one right here. And this again, this class 
would start at 62, and this boundary would be 64. So this class would either go from 62 to 63 or from 63 to 64. Section 2.4 is on statistical graphics, and this is going to talk about some other types of graphs besides just histograms. What we want to do with graphs is to be able to understand a data set by using a suitable type of graph that will reveal important characteristics about the data set. So which type of graph we use partly depends on which characteristics we're interested in. One type of graph is a stem plot or a stem and leaf plot. And this represents our data by separating each value into two parts, the stem, which is usually the leftmost digit, and the leaf, which is usually the rightmost digit. Here's a stem and leaf plot. This tells you that the stem part is the tens. This two would represent 20. The leaves over here would represent the units. So some of the data values from this data set would be 21, 22, 24, 24, and so on up to 29. That would be for this particular class. So the actual class that's represented here would be from 20 to 29. This one would go from 30 to 39, and so on. And most statistical software will create a stem plot for you and some of it will even give you the frequencies for each stem. And that's a really easy way to get a frequency distribution. If the software doesn't give you frequencies for each stem, you can go ahead and count it yourself, and that gives you a frequency distribution. For example, if we counted the number of data values here, we already know that the class represented is 20 to 29. So then we'd have our first part of our frequency distribution. Another type of graph is a bar graph. And remember, a histogram is just a specific type of bar graph that represents only quantitative data. But we can use other bar graphs to represent qualitative data. So in this bar graph, we have the different categories named on the horizontal axis. Our bar heights give us our frequencies for each category. So this does represent a different type of frequency distribution. It's a frequency distribution for qualitative data in this case. And if we talk about a Pareto chart, that's just a bar graph like this one where we represent the bars in order of their frequencies. This one starts with the bar with the highest frequency and goes down. Another common type of graph is a pie chart. Pie charts can just list the categories. They can list the categories like this with the frequencies included, or they can list categories and percentages. A time series graph is a different type of graph that represents values according to time intervals. This one happens to represent the number of drive-in movie theaters by year. Each one of these points is a different year and the number of drive-in theaters was counted. Finally, we have scatter plots, and these are used to represent data where we have actually two pieces to a data point. This scatter plot represents the number of chirps per minute and the temperature. So one point on this graph would actually have two data values associated with it. The first one would be the chirps per minute, which for this data point looks like approximately 900. The second piece of this data point would be the temperature, so we could guess that this would be around 80 degrees. Our last section in this chapter is about critical thinking, specifically related to bad graphs. When we talk about bad graphs, a graph can be bad in the sense that it contains errors, or it can be bad because it might be technically correct, but it's misleading. And it is very important to be able to look at graphs and recognize bad graphs and recognize whether they are misleading and how. So one way a graph can be misleading is by using a different scale on the vertical axis, where the vertical axis doesn't start at zero. What this does is it tends to exaggerate the differences between frequencies. 
So this graph on the left actually starts at 53, and that, if you notice, it makes it look like there's a large difference between the height of the bar for the Democrats and those for Republicans and Independents. But really, from 54 to 62 isn't that big a difference. So this is very much exaggerating that difference. If we look at a graph of the same data where the vertical axis starts at zero, this one represents the data much more accurately because you can see there's not much difference between the 62 and the 54. Another way graphs can be misleading is if the scales are different. Comparing these two graphs, the scale on the left side graph goes from 0 up to 35, while the scale on the right side only goes from 0 up to 12. So if you're just looking at the two pictures and not paying attention to the numbers, then you might think that there were many more motorcycle crashes represented here than there were car crashes, and that's not the case. Also notice that on the horizontal axis here, for the car crashes, we're going all the way up to 90. For the motorcycle crashes, we're only going up to 60. And that's not necessarily a problem, but you should be aware of this. This means that the oldest motorcycle driver, driver that was killed in a motorcycle crash in the study was 60, whereas the oldest possible car driver could have been as much as 90 years old. Now, pictographs are commonly used in media reports Pictographs are actually drawings of objects that are used to represent data, especially three-dimensional objects like money bags, stacks of coins, army tanks, people, and so on. The problem with pictographs is they can create false impressions and distort the data. For example, if a pictograph uses a square, if you double each side of a square, the area doesn't just double, it actually increases by a factor of four. So that can distort the data values. And actually, if you use cubes in a pictograph, if you double each side of a cube, the volume doesn't just double. It actually increases by a factor of 8. So that can be extremely misleading. Here's a pictograph that represents annual incomes of groups with different education levels going from no high school diploma at the bottom to an advanced degree at the top. The problem with this graph is that this cut up dollar here doesn't really give us much idea of what the different data values are or how they compare. It does include the numbers on the right side, which is helpful. Here's another pictograph that represents that same information. Notice in this one they use cubes, which again could be extremely misleading. The actual data values here go from approximately 18,000 up to 74,000. So this one is really about four times as much as the 18,000. But the cube, if the length of one side of the cube is four times as much, that means the volume of the cube is going to be 64 times as much. So this gives an extremely distorted picture of the difference between the various data values. Here's one more graph depicting the same information. And this one is very accurately represented. Notice that the vertical scale starts at zero. It does, again, include the actual data values, which is helpful. And there's no distortion or anything misleading about this graph. 